Welcome to Critical Recap. I'm Danny Carr, and I'm here to catch you up on the latest episode of Critical Role. You can also catch up with the Critical Role podcast on Spotify, iTunes, and Google. Make sure to check out CritRoll.com for cool merch and information on events like Gen Con and more. Now, here's what happened on episode 72, Clay and Dust. The Mighty Nine have arrived on the outskirts of the Kravarat Volcano. Essek teleports back to Rosanna, leaving the Mighty Nine to begin their trek to the volcano itself. As they walk into the snowy trees, a mist rolls in, and they see a woman in the distance. The woman disappears, and Clay detects an undead presence. They keep walking as ghosts begin to follow their journey. Jester reads aloud from Tusklove as they walk, attracting more ghosts. None attack, seemingly just interested in watching them. As they near the volcano, the ghosts slowly vanish. One by one, they all vanish entirely into the mist. That single female figure that you first encountered, the last one standing before disappearing. She stayed for the whole reading. <sighs> Biggest fan. She might have written it. In order to avoid the lava, Caleb and Jester polymorph themselves into eagles and fly the party up the mountain. They find an unnatural opening on the side, dropping the polymorph as they enter. Inside rests a lava pool, a black anvil, and an elderly dwarven woman. She recognizes the name Clay and warmly embraces Caduceus, introducing herself as Jeremy's Dust, the grand matron of the Dust family. Other members of the Clay family have already come to the kiln seeking answers about the corruption in the Savalier Wood. She introduces their lore keeper, Tyla Dust, who tells Clay that his family was looking for a certain kind of glass. Clay remembers his own vision of green glass and not pulls out her powdered residuum. They discuss the glass and Whitestone is mentioned as a main exporter. They test the powder in the lava, but it needs to be a solid piece. All right, now we know. Now we know. It's the trick with faith. Is that it's always an experiment? Is that if you're not willing to move forward in it until you know, then you don't need it, do you? If you know, it's not, not faith. faith. Clay shows the broken sword to Kendall Dust, who talks to Clay of its history but tells him that he cannot reforge it here. Clay communes with the Wild Mother, confirming that he is seeking residuum, that there are places outside of Whitestone to find it, and that they will find someone to reforge the sword in Uthodurn. Bo translates the Dwarven script written upon the walls of the kiln. There are tales of weaponsmiths, including Dolgrim, the forger of the Star Razor, and mention of an elven civilization that used to reside where the Savalier Wood is now. They decide to go to Uthodurn tomorrow to reforge the sword. As they get ready to sleep, Ford asks Jester if she'd send a message to Vandrin, asking where he is. You said you know Ford. <laughs> Haven't heard that name in a while. Glad he's doing well. Let him know I'm okay. Retired on a, an island. The confirmation that Vandrin is safe and not looking for Ford makes him feel that his search for his mentor is no longer important. He opens up to Jester about Ukatoa and the night he lost his powers. He tells her that the power makes him feel useful, but he wouldn't have done anything to get them back. She offers to get him powers from the Traveler, but he tells her that he's interested in talking to the Wild Mother. She approves of his choice and is excited about their new mission to get him away from Ukatoa. That night, Ford dreams of Ukatoa, who once again threatens him. He wakes up with his powers gone. Frustrated, he takes the falchion and goes alone to the kiln. He speaks out in his normal voice, saying that his patron needs him more than he needs Ukatoa. He begins pressing the blade deep into his chest, demanding his powers back. When nothing happens, he holds the sword over the lava pit, smoke curling around him as he grows calm. I'll pull the blade back. And throw it. <laughs> into the... <laughs> it disappears through the smoke. <laughs> you hear... The smoke dissipates in the direction of where you threw it about a moment later. And there you can see it resting and slowly sinking into the molten rock. 
Ford wakes up Clay, telling him what happened as Clay heals him. Ford claims that the sword was all he had, a comment Clay refutes. He applauds Ford for the battle that he won tonight, but he doesn't think that his fight is over. In the morning, Ford presents himself to the party with his natural voice, apologizing for keeping his real accent from them and explaining that the other voice made him feel like a leader. He tells them what he did to the Falchion and that he has lost his powers. The Nine support his actions and give him some of their magical items to offset his current lack of them before heading to Uthodurn. That is it for episode 72 of Critical Role. But is that really it? I have some thoughts. Holy shit, y'all. Ford is a text blade no more. It was incredible to watch that inner battle, and now there are so many paths that Ford could go down. Will he choose a different class? Will he be able to swear allegiance to the Wild Mother? How badly will Ukotoa fight to get him back? Will he send another champion after Ford? This decision has changed absolutely everything. Oh, Ford. Oh, Mighty Nine. Anyway, and this is super important because everything is different this week. Catch episode 73 live at Gen Con on Friday, August 2nd at 5 p.m. Pacific on twitch.tv slash critical role or a week later on our podcast. And stay tuned to critroll.com for all the latest updates. Hey y'all, thanks for watching this episode of Critical Recap. Make sure to like and subscribe and hit that little bell below to get notifications on all our uploads. Bye!